Hi, everyone, and welcome to a new Ancient Warfare Answers with me, Murray. Uh, I'm going to be answering a couple of your questions in a minute. Uh, but first, of course, you can uh, join us by asking a question. Uh, you can back us on Patreon uh, at one of three levels, Optio, Legionary, or Centurion. Uh, and, of course, you can send us a question however you like. Now, today's question is... Uh, well, not a favourite, but certainly one that I enjoyed receiving, um, which is from Tony P. Uh, can you tell us anything about the difference in style of combat when comparing late medieval Pike versus ancient Sarissa? Very exciting. Uh, for those of you that aren't excited, uh, join me uh, on the excitement tour, which is, of course, that the ancient Sarissa uh, is a uh, Macedonian weapon, uh, anything we're told between 10 cubits long, to 17 cubits long. Uh, most people today regard it as 14 to 15 cubits as being the average. Problem with that, of course, is what's a cubit? A uh, cubit is the length of a forearm, um, but it varies from state to state, from city to city. <laughs> so uh, it's tricky in terms of working out exactly how long a cubit is. Um, roughly 45 centimeters is what we normally estimate it, but it changes. Uh, there are other things as well about um, a breadth of a palm and the width of a palm as well. Um, so you'll hear in ancient sources things like um, cubit, palm, um, and that is problematic for us working out things because we like to be mathematically clear, and it's clear the sources weren't. They may have been to them if they were from Athens or from Corinth or from Thebes, but not for us, unfortunately. So uh, that's the first issue, is how long was the sword? Uh, so how long was the Sarissa? Long. There you go. But not so long that the ancient sources actually comment on it. There seems to have been a trend that the Sarissa was getting, that the hop, the hoplite spear, the dory, was getting longer uh, in the 4th century BC after the Peloponnesian War. So it's not commented upon as being especially long, uh, which is interesting in itself. But that's not the question. So I'll stay focused. Uh, so that was the first thing, is that uh, you have this long Sarissa-like pike. And what you find in the uh, Macedonian manuals later is the depth of the Macedonian phalanx is 16 men. Uh, and they are organized into units of, uh, I'm going to use the term sy syntagma uh, and syntagmata because um, there are other terminologies. But the syntagma is 256 men, so it's 16 ranks of 16 men. Uh, and that then accordions out to the full phalanx, which is slightly more than 9,000 men. So within each taxis of the phalanx, you had six syntagma. Uh, and then within the phalanx itself, there were six taxis. So, uh, and only ever six, never got any bigger than that with the Macedonians. So um, that's interesting in itself. But again, I'll stay focused. So that's the... Uh, the Macedonian phalanx, and it's an inexorable machine at moving forward. Uh, it doesn't seem to charge running. It seems to move forward uh, and obviously offer a great many Sarissa points towards the enemy. Um, it's also a defensive um, tool, and one of the remarkable things about the Battles of Alexander, for instance, is how few uh, casualties he suffers in, in that. Now, the men are armoured, um, but there must also have been some kind of disruption with the pikes above. Um, so, obviously, the first five ranks of the of the phalanx, their sarissa could extend beyond the front rank. Uh, so, you've got another 11 ranks of, of sarissas, which are presumably held vertical, or we think on a 45-degree angle to sort of create a, a hedgehog-like appearance. Uh, we don't know that for sure. Uh, the depictions we have of phalangites, which are very few, are all held underarm. That they're held with two hands, are uh, sort of beside the body, um, and that becomes important when comparing it to later phalanx warfare. So uh, the phalanx is this uh, marching in step, disciplined, well drilled uh, unit. Certainly, they seem certainly certainly they seem to be able to move forward at the double. Uh, but we don't get any, um, you know, running um, phalangites, for instance, in the battle accounts. They they move forward with cavalry. So presumably they must have moved quite quickly, but we don't get anything which specifically states that they are um, 
charging, as far as I can call, recall off the top of my head. Uh, now, what we find, therefore, in the medieval, uh, late medieval pike phalanx, which, again, um, is an interesting one because it seems to come about from the rediscovery of the manuals describing the Macedonian phalanx. Um, you've got translations of Elian, uh, and actually only Elian, um, in in the, the 1400s. So uh, that's fascinating in itself, but the pike square and things like that of the Swiss mercenaries and the other pike uh, manoeuvres that you get in the late medieval period are slightly different in the sense that, generally speaking, a pike square is 10 by 10, so it's 100 men rather than uh, the, the 256 man um, units that you get in the Macedonian phalanx. And they seem to hold their uh, pikes. Uh, again, the length of the pike is, is debated and changed anyway. It doesn't seem to be as, as long as the um, Macedonian uh, phalanx pike, uh, Sarissa. It's also, I think, slightly larger in diameter. Um, and the interesting thing there is that the whereas the Macedonians, it's it's always being moved forward by the um, infantrymen. What you find with the pike phalanx is that they the front rank will kneel, and we don't have any evidence that that's happening in the Macedonian phalanx. And they would plant their uh, pike in the ground, ready to receive a cavalry charge, which of course made them impregnable to cavalry charges, which was a, a great tool. Um, and then, of course, uh, there's also depictions of them using their... Uh, pike's overarm, which we don't have for the Macedonian phalanx, although it seems logical that you might do that. Um, that's a controversial thing to say. Uh, so you've got the the fact that it's overarm, you've got the fact that the front rank can kneel and plant their pike, and of course they charge, uh, and generally they run at uh, enemy units and at each other, uh, which is called the bad war, when, when, two pike, when two pike formations are charging one another things get bad because they get very violent and, and very bloody. Um, if you want to see the best depiction of such a thing on film, um, it's Captain Alla Triste with uh, Viggo Mortensen, known to you as Aragorn. Um, fabulous depiction of pike warfare and the confusion and the dust and the, and the, and the horror. Uh, so that's the modern pike is a, is a different weapon in that sense. Um, of course, it also becomes one where when the musket starts to become predominant, because they were so slow rate of fire, uh, had such a slow rate of fire, pike phalanxes are used to defend them. So there's a, there's a combination of musket and pike block to, to sort of uh, work in tandem. Whereas in Macedonian warfare, the pike phalanx is, is, is it uh, in the sense that it's the, it's the senior premier infantry formation um, it does, of course, need its flanks being guarded by cavalry or other infantry, light infantry, peltasts, Cretan archers, uh, hoplites even. Um, hypaspists, again, they're controversial. Are they hoplites or are they phalangites? We're not sure. Uh, so though, that, that's a really interesting, uh, sort of difference between the, the two types of warfare that you get in, um, the late medieval period and the ancient period. Of course, the other thing is that the, um, late medieval phalangite uh, isn't really, or pikeman, isn't really wearing any armour in the sense of what the uh, what the men in the Macedonian phalanx were looking. And that's probably due to the advent of gunpowder weapons and, and you know, that that, that kind of armour isn't really going to afford you much protection. Mostly there are, they are wearing helmets, um, but not necessarily um, any kind of armour. I mean, padded armour, yes, absolutely, for... for stopping blades and things like that but not not um the armor that you find in the macedonian phalanx um, which is still using um you know tube and yoke armor and thorax armor uh, and uh, muscled cuirasses made of bronze which uh, you know people have started using copper alloy don't like it i like saying bronze um although i was amazed to find that the uh amount of tin involved in a lot of the bronze from the ancient world is sort of less than 10 percent 
Uh, I'm not a, not a metallurgist by any means, but that was quite surprising to find out that the number, amount of tin you needed was actually quite small in comparison to the amount of copper. Uh, anyway, I digress. It's happened a lot in this answer. Um, so there you go. That's, I think, the major differences between the pike phalanx of the Macedonians versus the late medieval pike phalanx. Uh, I'm sure I've said some things wrong, especially when it comes to the medieval aspect of things. But uh, there's your answer. Look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks. Bye. Thank <laughs> you.